Welcome back, everybody, to the Who's Your Band podcast. Uh, we are back uh, with a brand new episode. Uh, back from vacation uh, is my co-host, uh, the very red uh, Mr. Sean Morton. How are you, Sean? I'm glad I, I'm glad I got some color. I got to tell Look, you. Your face is the same color as that Watt jersey behind you. Isn't it great? <laughs> you look like a tomato. I want to make sauce out of you. It's fun. You know what's amazing is that like I'm half Italian, half Irish, and like you know I have like the Italian desire to eat constantly. But like whenever I go out into the sun, I spontaneously combust. I don't get tan. I don't get this beautiful olive skin like the rest of my Italian family does. I go to this. This was in one day. One day. Does it hurt? No. My yeah, arms even got it too. Uh, well, Ugh. speaking of, of half Italians and and half Irish and half Viking and and what <laughs> we have with us today, he's a headliner comedian. He is the warm up comic for the Doctor Oz show. He is our buddy, Mister Richie Byrne. Richie, welcome to the show. What's up, boys? How are Sean? You? you know what you look like. I'm good. Remember the, what was it, Copper Tone, where they pulled a kid's bathing suit and his ass is completely white and everything else? You're like, like <laughs> you look like you could do that commercial, man. Oh, you're a dick. I'm glad, I'm glad nothing's changed since I've seen you last, Richie. You look like, you look like you're in a production of Damn Yankees and you're the, you're the devil. <laughs> look at you, man. That's great. <laughs> so what have you, you know been what? doing? Did <laughs> I just say something? If you put Jeffrey's facial hair on Sean, you have Satan. <laughs> you guys combined look like Satan. Jeff, take a look at Richie, by the way. Richie has a what's called a, a real man's beard, by the way. Yes. Well, do. It doesn't look like fucking goat balls hanging off the back <laughs> of, a, of a goat. Richie looks, <laughs> Richie looks very, very Nordic. You know, like he looks like he should be in front of, of a Viking ship blowing a horn, you know, that <laughs> got type of sound, and he's leading the invasion, you know, of, of the Danes. <laughs> well, you know what? I only grew this to hide my double chins because I gained weight. And people are like, well, it's so gray. It makes you look older. I'm like, so I have to decide, do I want to look older or fat? Uh, I'd, let it, I'd, I'd, I'd let it grow in a little longer, though, Richie. I, I would say Yeah, both. I just trimmed it yesterday. <laughs> I get it, Sean. Very funny, you red-faced motherfucking <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> there's there's, there's going to be no music talked about on this podcast. No. I can tell you right now. No, right. no, no. There, there is, because when we get to his band, his band is off the charts great i'm so yes, glad yes. we're going to talk about it but before that let's let's talk a little bit uh, uh to richie about what he does what you know um you're the warm-up comic for the dr yes. oz show um right so for our listeners that that, that aren't sure what does a warm-up uh, warm-up comic do like especially like well, for, you know, like like a medical show like that the new the new yorker magazine years ago did a a piece about oz an article and they mentioned me in the article which you would feel like that's really cool. Like New Yorker, it's a big magazine, mentioned me. And the guy called me an audience bluffer. And I just, <laughs> like I'm going around feeling everybody's balls and keeping everybody hard during the show. It's like, oh, the fluffer was great. So, but what I do is I, um, I go out before the show for about 10 minutes. You're kind of like a comic. You're like a stand-up comic, cheerleader, MC, host, whatever it takes, your job is to get the audience where they need to be. So when Oz hits the stage, they're just like, bang. You know, they're just there. And it, usually I get about 10 minutes up front and I get them going and then we start the show. But what people don't realize is we, we shoot to tape. So we're not, we're live in front of the audience, but we're not live uh, to, to the uh, TV audience. So sometimes, they can take 10, 15 minutes between segments to get to the next segment. So it's my job to keep the, the audience entertained while they're setting up for the next segment. So that's, that's where it could be tricky. You know, are you, I don't, doing, are you doing material or are you doing all crowd work? Both. What I, I, I'll do material. I actually have written a lot of jokes. He did a great thing in season one. He's a great guy. And uh, Joey Cola, who, Pretty much got me the job, who I pretty much owe my career to. Didn't he I do warm up for uh, Rachel he's Ray, right? He, he's the warm up for Rachel Ray right now. When they had called him, he was doing Martha Stewart at the time show. And 
they asked him to come over to Dr. Oz and he didn't want to leave Martha. So he recommended me. And normally a lot of shows now, when they, they look at a bunch of comics for warm up, like someone will come in for a week, another person will come in. But the Joey's word saying this is the guy was all that I had a year, a year contract just based on Joey Colas saying, this is the guy you want. And, you know, so I'll always owe Joey. And, and every year I've been signed to do another year, except for this year where there's no audience. So, uh, but the first season, Joey, Joey's advice to me was don't ever make fun of the host. He said, the host is the star. They're there to see them. If you make a joke at the host's expense, the audience is going to turn on you. And about three or four months into the show, Oz used to go out into the audience a lot and talk to the audience. And he said something one day, and I made a joke about it, what he said. I don't remember. And, but it was like a, a shot at him, and he laughed. And I went up to him later. I go, listen, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. He goes, what? He said, I should never make fun of you. And he goes, no, I think you should do it more. And I, he goes, make fun of me more. I really, and so I started writing jokes where I make fun of him. But I told him, and you guys will understand this. I said, listen, if I do this, you have to laugh. If you don't laugh, they won't know I'm kidding. So a lot, he, a lot of times he's not really even paying attention because he's got producers in his ear. He's busy with a segment, whatever. But he'll just start laughing because he thinks I'm making fun of him. It's the cutest thing. Mm. Like, you'll look over and I was just going, <laughs> you're like, I didn't even say anything yet. <laughs> so, but he's a very giving performer that way. And half of my act now is just making fun of him, which I think is hysterical. The guy went to Harvard. He went to UPenn. I barely got out of Wagner College with a theater degree, and I'm making fun of him. You know what by, I mean? By the way, Sean, Richie is also a fellow Staten Islander. Fellow Staten Islander. Sorry to hear that. Yes. Sorry to hear yes. that. Yes. Born and raised. I'm a Farrell boy. How yeah. many How many seasons have you been with uh, Doc Oz? Well, they just started their 12th season. I've been with it since the beginning. But right now, there's no audience. That's Hopefully, great. by January, they'll bring in a, at least a small audience. In. But yeah, I've been with them since day one. Uh, oh, wow. It's cool what you mentioned that like he takes the joke. You know what I mean? Because oh. you can imagine like... You know, not only he's a TV host, but he's a doctor, but he's a celebrity at this point. Yeah. He's yeah. a very big celebrity. And, and once you get to that celebrity status, it's kind of like the rules kind of change a little bit, you know, and, and, yes. the, and the yes. ego kind of kicks in. But I'm glad to see that he still, like, appreciates the fact that he can take a joke. No, dude. dude I, I treat him like we treat each other before we went on the air. I mean, like, I'm killing him. Yeah. And he, he's so good about it, you know. He really is. He's the guy's a great guy. I, you don't have enough time on your show for me to tell you some of the great things he's done for me, for my family. He's a great guy. I have nothing but great things to say about him. But um, I watch him every morning, every morning on Fox Five on News Fox. because I'm an unemployed comedian, <laughs> and, and he's on there every day. <laughs> uh, he actually years ago did a show. A, a company called Usana who is a great company, and they sponsored a show case for him at, at uh, Radio City Music Hall and uh, 7,000 people and I, I opened that show. He, he oh, wanted me wow. to open that show. That was very, very cool, man, to be at Radio City sold out. And, you know what I that's mean? That's amazing. Was, was that a highlight of your career, Rich? Oh, that's way up there, Jeffrey. Yeah, man. I mean, you guys, you walk out on the stage of Radio City before anybody's in there, you can't believe the layers of uh, of of seats just it's just so amazing it's it's overwhelming and then to have be I, I mean i literally was standing behind that curtain and they go ladies and gentlemen welcome to the Us usana presents the dr oz blah 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 whatever give it up for dr oz's opening act richie burn and the curtains just open and you hear Wah! and you're like oh my god and you're on radio city stage i mean the most one of the most iconic well, you, was your family in, in the in attendance yes yeah, my family was there. It was very cool, dude. It was very cool. Awesome. And they have two big screens. And I look up, and I'm, there I am on these two big screens to the side of the street. And all I can think is, wow, I'm a fat motherfucker. That's all <laughs> I can think. And you can't really stop looking don't. at yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hate when there's a screen. Um, Jeff had a also... similar situation, too, last week when he did that rooftop show in Sheepshead Bay, and there was seven people there. <laughs> 
You can hear it all. You can hear it all the way to Bay Ridge. Let me tell you. A fucking rooftop show. This, 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 this is the industry that we've chosen. You also yeah. did the uh, St. George Theater. That had to be a thrill for you because, you're, like we said, you're a Staten Island guy and you're playing. Like, I mean, it's a beautiful theater. It's a theater that oh. was used in, in the in the movie School of Rock. Um, I, yeah. I mean, we've we've seen concerts. I mean, I, I saw uh, Jay Leno and so many other concerts. How, what was it like to perform there? That Jeffrey, I'm glad you brought that up. And what happened was, I was at Brigada. Uh, a couple of years ago. And after the show, I was outside of the theater and this woman comes up to me. She didn't, she didn't know I was from Staten Island. She didn't know anything. She goes, hi, she, you were great. I go, thanks. She goes, I own a theater. I want you to play my theater. So I'm thinking, you know, I'll, you know, you have these two, 300 seat theaters all over Pennsylvania or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I go, oh, what's your theater? And she goes, it's called the St. George Theater. She what, had the no door, idea I was from Staten Island. Doreen, yeah. 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 And uh, I was, she said, I, I go, I can't sell your theater. You know, it's 1,800 seats. 1800, she said, uh, 1800, we're going to make right. it work. Yeah. She said, we're going to make this work. And we did. I mean, we, we had about 600 people and uh, we sold the whole bottom. It was really cool because she only cared about that. She wanted to sell the bottom. Right, right. And uh, when I got on stage, Jeff, I go, um, I go, listen, when the show's over, you people at the bottom, stay where you are. We're going to clear the top out first so nobody <laughs> leaves. <laughs> and I had, I had a lot of friends from college show up, a lot of friends from high school, a lot of family. That was a very cool – it was a year ago, May, and it was a very cool experience because I grew up in the St. George Theater, you know? So it was really amazing. I'll, I'll always be indebted to Doreen for doing that. And she even wants me to come back again. I was supposed to be there this coming January, but obviously we have to move it because of this fucking bullshit that's going on. It's a, you know? it's, it's, have you ever been there, Sean? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I have Staten Island roots, too. You know, I've been Yeah, there. I mean, I, I've seen, like, tons of contests. My wife and I, we're, we're members. We donate to it every year. Uh, it yeah, may be it, the most beautiful theater I've ever seen. I mean, you look, all you got to do is look up. And it's, like, breathtaking. That holds the chandelier yeah. and the... The decor, it's unbelievable, that thing. It's like a mini version of uh, the Beacon Theater. Yeah, you're right. I it, is. See that. it is. That's I what I would... Uh, but, but, Rich, besides um, warm-up, and I also want to ask you about that. Do you take jokes from your regular stage act and bring it into to Oz, or do you, are you working out? Is it a good place to work out new jokes? Um, it's both. Jesus, I told you this was going to happen. Thing is falling. Hang on. Um, it's both, Jeff. Uh, you, I have stock jokes that I wrote just for the Doctor Oz show that I'll do. I have like jokes about kale, things like that, because he's a big proponent of kale and blah blah blah. Um, and then I'm able to. I'll like go. Uh, oh, I spent the weekend with my parents, and then I can go into stuff from my act. You know what I mean? Because a lot of my act is about my family. Um, and a lot of times I'll just take whatever they're talking about in the segment. You guys know, you, you stand off watching the segment and you go, oh my God, I can make fun of this. I can make fun of that, you know, but you also have to be careful because it, on my show, because it's not just all fun and games, you know, it's yeah. not just Rachel Ray cooking or, you know, what at Merv Griffin, whatever, this serious subject. And sometimes you, you got to really watch what's going on you don't want to step on somebody who's talking about their weight problem or their cancer or whatever they have and then you go out you do a joke and it's you know off color you know so you have, and you have to sometimes i even let the audience breathe with that show like if it's a really serious subject i won't just go right in and material I'll just because i have a sound guy so he's playing music which helps so sometimes you just wait and you don't you know you just don't you got you to know your audience. You got to know what you're doing. So you're, you know, you can't. you're very much in the moment. Um, I also... Yes. Do they, do they um, record uh, different shows like in the same day? Yes. We do about two and a half shows in one day. With the same audience? No, it's two different audiences. Okay. Do you repeat okay. material? Well, the problem is, is we get a lot of... There's people out there who are, who are our audience... Uh, regulars uh, and there's a lot of them and they go from show to show to show 
and and it's like the and what what they do is the audience pe the people who bring in the audience um they know them so like they'll say i really need you to come in on this thing because like people don't come out in february when you know yeah. so these audience regulars will show up in february because then when there's a big guest on in april they'll go hey i want to come in for that show and, and they'll let them in because they're showing up there it's almost like a job for them and so i'm playing to about 30 40 people who've seen who see me a million times and i that's kind of hard because you get to know them but you know what jeffrey when i did the saint george show there had to be 40 to 45 people who were those audience who came from the bronx from brooklyn from from queens and they all sat in the front row together like it was that was a very cool moment to me all these audience regulars who go from show to show to show showed up on that friday night at st george theater and couldn't have been better just you know laughing and and just so supportive and i'll never forget that it really touched me you know that they all got together paid the money and came who was who was some of the guests that uh appeared on the Oz show that saw you and did anyone ever come up to you afterwards you know and maybe I, like say something all the time. Yeah, i'll tell you yeah, all right i'll tell you a couple of stories i'll tell you this one first because it's a music story valerie bertinelli was on the show oh my god yeah. you, ask, you had to ask her about eddie right well, wait so she's on the show and she's lovely man she's amazing really cool really cool person how long so ago was she, this this is about seven or eight years ago how'd so, she look she looked great she had just lost a lot of weight and that's why she was on talking about her weight oh, i like her a little chunky i'm not gonna lie <laughs> she's beautiful oh yeah she's just oh my god and just, you know what as pretty as she is an even better personality oh, that's you know so like she's here. So, so she's one of my favorite guests we ever had so she comes on the show and this was i took a chance here she's talking about her ex-husband ed she was, I'm talking, she kept saying, so I told Ed this, and she must have said Ed like five times, right? So we go to commercial, and I'm on the mic, and I'm, I'm doing, I'm going, Ed, Ed. I'm just going, Ed. And she looks up, she goes, do you have a problem? I go, his name's not Ed. His name's Eddie. It's Eddie Van Halen. You can't, and she goes, he's my ex-husband. I'll call him whatever I want. I go, you think Priscilla walked around calling her ex-husband L? <laughs> <laughs> did she have a sense of humor oh dude she laughed her ass off six months later she comes on the show again she sees me in the hallway she's in her dressing room i go by she sees me she goes hey hey i gotta talk to you I go, she goes i talked to my ex-husband ed and i told him <laughs> that you have a problem with me calling him ed he said i could call him whatever i want and all i go is you talk to Eddie Van Halen about me? Like, that was all <laughs> she, she got really mad. She's like, ah, like, she really wanted to argue with me? Like, and, and I just was like mesmerized that somebody discussed me with Eddie Van Halen. You know what I mean? Like, she's Wolfgang's mother, right? Yeah. She's Wolfgang's mother, yeah. Yeah, yeah. holy shit. That yeah. is fucking She's been on the show iconic. a lot. She's been on the show a lot. And I, I know when Valerie Bertinelli's on the show, I'm going to have fun because I can play with her. She plays back. So, and you know, and I, I, I was, some people don't want, they don't want to see you to the, you know, they're, they don't want to talk, they're focused. And I get that, but other people really want to play. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Jennifer Hudson was on and she's really sweet. She was scared to death of me. Like she wouldn't talk. She, she, when we went to commercial, she's like, you, you watch out you watch out you and she had two cousins in the audience and her cousins were going play with him play with him <laughs> and just, you know, go play with him and then they call me over they go she's so shy you got to tell her to have fun and i think she's an amazing talent that girl oh, so oh, what a just, voice on her yeah and yeah, Sean, so is, that was, isn't she married isn't she married to a wrestler yeah david atunga who's a, yeah. who's a, oh, a really? lawyer actually yeah he's actually a harvard know. lawyer too uh, I'll tell you another story. Um, we had Michelle Obama when when she was first lady. What was the security and like that for? On it's what I was just about to say. It's they a week before Secret Service comes in and they have to address everybody who works on the show. Anybody who's going to be on the set has to be at this meeting, and they say, "Do not approach her. 
if any, they said, do not approach her. When she's on the set, don't make any sudden moves towards her because we'll have to take you down. Wow. And I raise my eye, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I go, I'm the warm-up guy. <laughs> I have to, I have to come down to the set during the, when I come down to the set, don't shoot me. <laughs> don't, and they're like, okay. So, and once you go in the door to the studio, you cannot leave. You have to, they, they, they I, it's real serious shit, man. So, they had to screen everybody who came in too. Yes. Yes. Yep. Screen everybody, anybody who worked there, you get screened, you cannot leave. So go to the bathroom now. You're not going to the bathroom again until the show's over and she's gone. You cannot. So uh, this is a really cool story. So she's on the show and she was great. She was great. And I'm doing jokes. I'm, I'm doing my thing and all. And she starts, she doesn't, she doesn't play with me. She didn't, she, but she was watching and laughing. Six months later, she comes on the show again. And, um, and I'm doing my thing. And they go to commercial. And Oz is going to take pictures with her. We had, they had like five or six photographers there. Some of them were for us. Some of them were for her. But that, whenever there's a celebrity on, they have a photographer there. They take pictures and all that shit. So Oz is taking pictures with Michelle Obama. So I don't, I know, and there's six, like six or seven photographers. So I don't want to get in the way. So I wait for them. I don't do anything. I'm just standing there waiting for them to finish. Then I'm going to go into my spiel, right? Oz turns to me and goes, Richie, and I don't understand anything he says. It, he, it just sounded to me like, bah, 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 bah. I couldn't understand what he said. So I thought he said, you're in the way. I thought there was a camera behind me. So I got to stand up for this. <laughs> I go like this. Like, and there's no one behind me. And I look back, and Oz and Michelle Obama are staring at me. And, and Dr. Oz goes, what are you doing? Shit, hold it. Sorry. <laughs> Damn it. So damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Hold on. <laughs> we'll fix this in post. The, the, Can't you have Oz like Venmo you $30 to buy a fucking <laughs> tripod or something? <laughs> I have a tripod. I had to put it on the table. because This is a new tripod up, that he has. <laughs> so Dr. Oz goes, what are you doing? And I go, what did you say? He said, I said, come over here. The first lady wants to take a picture with you. And I look over at Secret Service, and they go like, go ahead. and I walk over, and Michelle Obama I go, takes a picture with me. And, and she goes, uh, I was hoping you still worked here. And I go, why, did you hear something? <laughs> <laughs> and she started laughing. Do you have and the have picture this, in your house? I have it somewhere. I don't have it up, but I have it somewhere. And I, I, I remember I posted it on Facebook, and I said, this is why my boss is the coolest boss in the world. Cause that, you know what I mean? For him yeah. to let, have her come over and do that. But she want, he said, Richie, she wanted the picture. She really, she liked, so that was kind of cool. Uh, we had Trump on and uh, that was before, it was during the election, the first election. So this was about 2015. Yeah. And uh, man, there were people in that audience. If, you, if they had a gun, he would have been dead. I mean, you could see there were people trying to kill him with their eyes. You know what I mean? And I, I went out and I'm like, listen, it's a TV show. <laughs> I go, I don't know what your beliefs are. Keep them to yourself. Let's have some fun, blah, blah, blah. So Trump took the mic from me. At one point, he takes the mic from me and, it, and he goes to the audience, how's he doing? And the audience goes crazy. And then I take the mic back. I go, how's he doing? And some people <laughs> booed. <laughs> Hey, Rich, you know, you not only do you appear behind the scenes, you know, doing warm up, but you also appeared in front of the camera as well. You were, uh, did you appear in an episode of uh, Sex and the City, Sopranos? Yes, I did. Florida? Yeah, tell us about it. Was... Is that something you want to pursue further, or is that something that kind of fell in your lap acting? Uh, no, that was, I mean, I have a degree in, in theater. I, I, that, I never wanted and you, I never you thought alluded about that. You said you went to Wagner. That's actually a very good, uh, school for acting. It's a good Wagner never... College, which is on Staten Island, which has a tremendous theater um, education. They're, they're, it's really a great place for theater. Did you appear in the plays there? 
Yeah, I, I, you know what, Jeffrey, great I production. could sing. Great little theater there, too. Yeah, I, I, had a, I, I could sing, and that was a big deal, because when you're in high school, all the plays are musicals. You know, it's very rare that anyone did anything but musicals. So the fact that I was able to sing opened up a lot of doors for me, because, uh, you know, oh, fuck, man. Shit. Fucking guy. With <laughs> I'm well, Wagner Wag Wag does. I'm gonna kill some time. Look, look, look at the shot we're getting. <laughs> and a shot of his stomach and his tits. Uh, oh, thank God he had pants on. Jesus. Look! Look at this <laughs> shot. <laughs> we, we just got taint. We just got tainted. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I was, fuck! I got teabagged by Richie Byrne just now. <laughs> This is, a, this is like if Fred Flintstone was trying to operate a fucking camcorder. Oh, my God <laughs> almighty. Hang on. Where'd I go? Your friend, okay, now we, we got him back. Okay. We, 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 listen, we, we were on a roll. We had some momentum. And, okay. I know. I suck. The screws. Hang on. Are we ready? Are we good? All right. Okay. We're we're back we we just, like we just saw a cross shot of Richie Byrne, and we can guarantee now he is half Irish. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Well, so when I got out of college, I was doing theater. I, I was doing a regional theater. I was doing summer stock. And uh, people were saying to me, you know, you're really funny. You should try stand up. And uh, I never thought I, I'm like, I can't write my own material. That was, you know, like that. Was, and uh, somebody said, a, a college professor said to me, anything you can do to um, make yourself more known. It's going to help you. So if you can get like kind of a name and stand up, you should go. So I started going open mics and that's how it happened. That, and, and I, I used to say, I'm an actor who does stand up. And one day a friend of mine goes, when was the last time you did a play? And I'm like, like six years ago, he goes, you're a stand up dude. You're not an actor who does stand up. You're a stand up. I'm you went like, the stand up route as opposed to doing improv. Yeah, you know, I, I never did a lot of improv. I never found it that interesting for some reason. I, I love the idea of stand-up. I love the idea of maybe you alone you're funny. Is that why? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in like around 2000, I, I had an agent, and they started sending me out on commercials. Uh, and, I, and it's funny, I, I did a ton of commercial auditions and never got one commercial. And I only auditioned for about five or six TV shows and got three of them. You know, I, I did the big, I always say I did the big three, uh, Law and Order, Sex and the City, and Sopranos. I say I did um, Law and Order, I didn't, get, I didn't get arrested. I did The Sopranos, and I didn't get whacked. And I did Sex and the City, and I didn't get laid. I'm probably the only guy who can say that. Which episode of Sopranos did you do? It was uh, called Cold Cuts. It was um, Tony's sister Janice punches out a woman on the sideline of a kid's oh, soccer yeah, game. Yeah, I remember that episode. Yeah, I'm the referee. Oh, who breaks shit. it up. Yeah. She actually had a whole scene with me first where she uh, runs on the field and it's yelling at me and we get in a fight. And I'm like, oh, this is so important. There's no way they can cut this. And they cut the whole thing, dude. You know how that oh, happens. Right? Of course. And so all you end up seeing is me like running over the sidelines going, ladies, what are you doing? Like that's all you, I had this whole great scene where she's screaming at me and kicking me in the ass and everything. Was, and they cut all of it. It's, I, that sucks when that happens, man. I, was, I, um, I had originally gotten a part in a, in a movie that's on Amazon Prime now. It's called um, uh, Night, 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 Late Night, Late Night, Late Night. But uh, Mindy Kaling is in it. And I think Kate Blanchett. And I was supposed to play this uh, MC. She's a comedy writer for a show. And, you know, I had never heard and never got, a, never got any itinerary, anything. They filmed the movie. And I'm like, fuck this. I'm never going to watch this movie. I'm all pissed off. You know, they, they played me dirty. And then I, I, you know, I wind up watching it. You know, curiosity got the best of me. And it turns out they cut the whole scene completely. You know? Like, you can't yeah. stuff personally. Yeah, it just happens. Um, yeah, you know, well, Jeffrey, let me ask you because... You you amazed me because uh, as an actor, you know, I like get just getting on those sets was overwhelming to me. Like I'd love I once they got Doctor Oz, I couldn't really I didn't have as much time to audition, so I haven't really done anything. But I really want to get back into that because 
I know so much more now about camera shots and what they're doing and why they're doing it. I didn't know anything. You know, I was a theater actor and a comic. I really didn't understand film and everything. And then you get the Irishman and you were so calm about it. Like you were like, like you're working with the biggest names in the fucking business. And I remember talking to you about it. I'm like, weren't you overwhelmed? You're like, nah, not really. I'm like, he's either really the coolest guy in the world or the fucking dumbest guy in the world. I'm not sure which. Yeah, I think it's probably the second one. I know one. what it is. Uh, <laughs> Wait, Jeff, that you were an Irishman? Fucking, that, was a, that was a layup. But you know what, Rich? Prior Did to that, I had... you were the Irishman? <laughs> yeah, it never comes up. Uh, <laughs> you don't here's shoot one in here every Richie, two seconds. Here's no. what guarantees that's going to come up <laughs> at some point on every fucking episode of this show. Staten Island, Brooklyn, the Irishman, fucking Journey. Journey, Journey comes up on every goddamn episode. Journey? Twisted Sister and fucking Zebra come up on every show, every episode. I, I, let me tell you, I, I am the guy, I am Johnny from the Cobra Kai. But Rich, you know, prior to comedy and everything else that, that's gone on, you know, I used to uh, work and tour with bands. And so I was around, like I would, talk and hang out with Springsteen and Bono and and oh, uh, really? no, I didn't know that yeah yeah I mean I mean I was backstage hanging out on I mean major stuff like like the uh Atlantic Records 20 uh 40th uh anniversary show I did the rehearsal I, at one point I was only one of 25 people that was in Madison Square Garden when Zeppelin got together and it was uh the original band minus John Bonham but Jason played um, right. I, yeah. I mean, I did four different tours with the Stones, uh, of the Harley Davidson uh, tour in 2002. So, I mean, I really traveled and did all that stuff. So, you know, there would be actors and athletes that would come to these shows and I would, I would have to socialize with them and talk with them. So it was, you know, working with, with these guys. I mean, it felt you, 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 you inside, like you're busting because you're excited to be working with them. But honestly, I had met guys just as big, if not bigger. But did you have any background in film before? Because you, you, I mean, that kind of came out of nowhere, didn't it for you? The, 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 not the, really. No. Um, early on, um, I also, you know, Staten Island guy. I was in uh, theater in, in uh, Staten Island, uh, did a little bit of college, and then I stopped. But I always had kind of an interest in it. Um, you know, I, I, I did, you know, I did get cast in a commercial. I got cast actually in a lead in a Ford commercial. Um, really? And that, yeah, and that okay. kind of opened the door so for me. you did have a background. Yeah. So I you know, I, it, it amazes me that you and I really don't know each other better. Because, like, we, I mean, it, it's surprising we didn't meet earlier. Uh, and, I mean, and, and I know the last three years I haven't been allowed to hang out with you. But that's another story <laughs> for another time. I think Sean knows this. I was I was forbade from hanging out with you, but I don't um, know that actually. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you later. Tell you after. I'll tell you later. <laughs> don't, don't worry about. It. <laughs> but um, but I'm, I mean, you and I, we have so many things in common, Jeffrey. I mean, we're both huge sports fans. Yeah. You know, I didn't realize that you had a background in music. I didn't. I didn't realize any of that. You know, I mean, um, how, what what did you do? What, what was your job? I did sec music? security and production. Really? Yeah. So I mean, like, you would get hired, and you would do different things. Like you know, you would do. I would do the local runs. I would do, uh, you know, the, the touring. Um, I, I mean, listen, putting on a show, and especially like these, some of these bigger shows. I mean, there there's a million things that would come up. Simply, there would be times that I would have to go to an arena where it was uh, like it's called like a dock a dock day where there's no show going on. And mm -hmm. just like kind of hang out in the production office because maybe Max Weinberg needs uh, is waiting for drum heads to come, and you just can't leave that stuff lying around because you know you, you're always worried about people stealing shit. Um, I would I, I would go to McCartney's hotel room, and someone had to stay in the room while he was doing Saturday Night Live, or he was coming in the city for something, or to do a bunch of shows. I mean, I got a million stories like this. It, like when it comes out of my mouth, it doesn't sound like it's true because you you're. you're you're dealing with like the bit like I, I met McCartney and worked with him and would talk with him and his wife, you know, Linda would give us a uh, dinner as long as it wasn't uh, as long as it wasn't meat, you know. So it was it was just like so much of that stuff. Can I tell you? I have a McC can I tell you my McCartney story? Of course, we'd love to hear it. It's a music show. Um, 
I, when I was like six or seven years old, my dad came home from work. My dad owned a, a, his own uh, commercial laundry business. So he did linen supply for all different restaurants and stuff. And my dad came home from work and someone had given him an album. Said, hey, you have kids, right? Give this to your kids. And it was Meet the Beatles, which was the Beatles' first American album. It was the offshoot of With the Beatles. It was the first American album of the Beatles in America. And I don't know why they get, I don't know why they had it. It, was, it wasn't open yet because it was literally seven or eight years since that album had been released. It was, I didn't know. I was six years old. I didn't know anything. So I put that album on, and I tell this story all the time. I go, put that album on, and my life changed. From hearing that album, I learned about, I understood music. I understood harmonies. I understood, I learned all that, just hearing those guys sing. And, and I became a huge Beatles fan, just major Beatles fan. At, at seven years old, I was buying Beatle records when I was eight. And, and then from there, I learned about other music. And, Rich, and that could have the- very... That could have very simply been the Beach Boys. If someone right. had given you a Beach Boys, because when, when you just mentioned about metal, uh, melody, harmony, I mean, that, that, that right. you know, uh, that is absolutely the Beach Boys, who was, was also a band that influenced the Beatles greatly. Right. But it, but it was the Beatles and the Beatles, the Beatles. So as I got older, I got in other music, Zeppelin and, you know, Floyd, so big and Floyd and everything. And, uh, uh, but, you know, for me, the Beatles were always the first, the, you know, the Beatles. And then because of that album, I learned how to sing. So when I got into high school, a buddy of mine said, hey, man, uh, I do the plays. You should come audition. And I auditioned for Guys and Dolls singing If I Fell by the Beatles, which is like the stupid so who, thing. Who but, are you? Were you big? I would see. I could see you as Big Julie. I was but that's just not... in the chorus. Oh, I was okay. just in the chorus. Okay. So um, for that. So, so, you know, you know, before we run out of time, I, I do want to talk about your band. And I okay, well, love- wait, wait, I gotta finish okay, the go story. Ahead, go. You gotta let me finish the story. So <laughs> we're gonna cut out all that shit where I keep dropping the camera. So no, we're not. We got plenty of- no, we don't. Listen, <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> this this show is a, is a one take show. <laughs> you guys sound like when I do my podcast with Mark Riccadonna, I always go, we'll fix that in post. And Mark goes, no, we're not. No, we're not. I pray, I pray to God that I'm going to work with you at some point. And when I do, I'm blowing up a picture of your crotch. And I'm going to hold <laughs> it over my head as I'm opening it up for you. <laughs> well, you'll never work with me. But anyway, um, so because of the Beatles, I got into theater. You understand? From high school, I went to college. I majored in theater. I got a degree in musical theater. From high school, from college, I went on. I started doing regional theater, started doing um, uh, tours, things like that. Because of theater, I got into stand-up. Because of stand-up, I got into warm-up. So I ended up on the set of the Dr. Oz show, in my mind, all because of the Beatles. Now, who we shot right across the hall from Jimmy Fallon. Who was on Jimmy Fallon one night? Paul McCartney. And I always noticed that musicians will say, if it wasn't for the Beatles, I never would have learned. If it wasn't for the Beatles, always musicians. And I, and I wanted him to know that if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been a comedian and a warm up. Like it was really important for me to tell him that for some reason. So. He's on Fallon, and I'm in the hall, and they had monitors in the hall. And I I knew exactly when he finished where he was going to come out. He was going to come through these doors. He was going to walk over there and go to his dressing room. So I stood in front of his dressing room. There were a lot of people in the hallway. I stood right in front of his dressing room. And all I wanted to say to him was, "If if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And in my mind, he would understand. You know what I mean? He would get that. It was just, and that's all. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And he finishes the set with the, the, the segment with Fallon. He gets up to leave. He goes out the doors. When he comes out the doors, he gets swamped by people. He's got people all over him. And I'm like, shit. Because now he's like, I don't know if he, so security gets the people away. And McCartney comes walking up and he's face to face with me. And, I'm, and in my head, I'm going, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for you. And some guy in a suit steps in front of me and cuts me off. But, so I push the guy. 
it out of the way. I, I literally pushed the guy out of the way, and it was Lauren Michaels. Oh, I fucking pushed <laughs> Lauren Michaels. So oh, I find shit. it interesting. In, in my mind, I thought my career began with the Beatles, and now it's going <laughs> to end with the Beatles. So now I'm face to face with McCartney, my idol. In my head, I go, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And my my mouth just said, "What's up?" That's all I oh, can say. Oh, you blew, you blew yeah, it. Yeah. And McCarty, I swear to God, McCarty looks at me, he goes, what's up? And then he just walks into his dressing Oh, no. But in my mind, I felt like he knew. He knew. Oh, no. Richie, I had, a, I had a very similar story like that, too, because I, I was also a singer for a long time in a band. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I sang in a band. That's how I became a comic, blah, blah, blah. But, like, the band for me was Guns N' Roses, so... Uh, I got the chance to meet Slash, which is like my my hero. Right. I have a Slash tattoo right here. I, I, it's ridiculous. So my friend says we're at a concert. And I've, I've said this story on the show before, but you'll appreciate it. Um, she goes, Slash is going to go out, outside the, the venue. Go right after the show. He's coming right outside. I'm like, this is great. Same thing. Guy lines up. This fucking huge line. Guy comes out and goes, look, Slash is going to be here. He's going to take, you know, he's going to sign everything. Just can't take pictures. Got to move the line along. He'll shake your hand, talk to you, whatever. I'm like, this is great. I'm going to do the same thing to him. I'm going to say, you're my favorite musician. I got into music because of you. I got into comedy right. because of music. Same exact thing. I walk up to him and I'm like, there's one person in front of me. He's signing. He's like, yo, what's up, man? And the guy's like, ah, oh, it's cool. Thank you so much, man. I'm freaking out. I can't talk. And I'm going to tell him the whole story. He's five foot four. No right? way. He's five, four and I'm six, three. So, so I'm, I see him and he looks up at me and he goes, what's up, dude. And I went, yeah, <laughs> literally that's exactly what came out of my mouth. So I think he thought I was a Jerry's kid or something like that. And he just saw, he signed it really quick and they pushed me away. And I and rightfully so. Oh my god! But I want to talk about Pink Floyd. Yes, I love Pink Floyd. Yeah, okay. Rich, you're, you're, we, we've this is about our thirty-first episode of this show. Yes, and this is the first time we're really mentioning Floyd. We've talked yes. about David Gilmore before. Exactly. But I really? I love love Pink Floyd. What got you into Pink Floyd? Uh, marijuana. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, I mean, when I was like. 12 uh i think i heard the wish you were here album came out and i was already starting to get into zeppelin sabbath and i knew of pink floyd but i wasn't really and i went out and bought that album and it was like oh my god this is amazing and and it, what it was, was it about it that you liked because at, at a young age that's that's pretty deep stuff to kind of comprehend and and it, it it's it's not like it, there's a buildup with that, especially with uh, with uh, "Wish You Were Here" because yeah. there's only what maybe like five, six different titles on the song. Yeah, but there are different parts of it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you have "Shine On Your Crazy Diamond" parts one through six, and then at the end, "Shine On Your Crazy Diamond" parts seven through twelve, which is that was freaky to me. I've never seen. Uh, I think that what turned me on to it was I was very into heavy, harder rock, you know, like Zeppelin, and, and although Zeppelin. I, I always feel Zeppelin gets kind of called the, the fathers of heavy metal, but they did some really, you know, acoustic, great acoustic shit. And they, I mean, they were geniuses, you know, but I, I knew a lot about Zeppelin. I knew a lot about Sabbath, but I also knew a lot about Rush. Not Rush, really. Yes. I was really in a yes and Jethro Tull. So to me, Floyd kind of had, was somewhere in between both of that, the really avant-garde, bluesy jazzy thing and then the hard rock bluesy thing floyd kind of found a middle section there and it just spoke to me and then uh, i got you know my friend turned me on the dark side of the moon and uh, which i i had have worn out i was literally one of those people who wore that album out like i probably bought three albums like that album stayed on the charts for so long because people kept wearing it out you know they kept Not, just playing 950 it. weeks it charted yeah I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And then when, when I was, you know, a senior in high school, the wall hit. And, uh, yeah, 79, 78. And then the movie came out. Yeah, yeah. And my, 
my buddies I and I, I, yeah, I was like 19, 20, and my buddies and I would go in the city just about every Saturday night, and we would go to the planet, Hayden Planetarium. Uh, oh, they, had, they had Laser Floyd. They had Laser Floyd, and you cannot, I will never, that was, un, Laser Floyd was the coolest thing back then. You just get so high and go in there, and they would play that music and have the lasers. And then we'd leave there, and we'd go over to the 8th Street Playhouse at midnight, and every Saturday night, 8th Street Playhouse showed the wall. And we would watch the wall every set. It was a thing, it was a thing we did. We did the planetarium and then the wall for like about six months. And it just, I was just, I became a Pink Floyd fanatic, you know. And uh, I, I actually never saw the four of them together. I saw, I've seen Roger Waters and I've seen the other which, three. Which tour? I, I saw him on the pros and cons of Hitchhiking Tour. And I saw him on the Radio Chaos Tour. I saw him pros and cons twice. I saw him when Clapton was doing it. Oh, wow. People forget, yeah. Clapton played guitar on that. Clapton, I read an interview with Clapton where he said that, um, he said, I, I agreed to play on the album for Roger Waters and then woke up one day with a hangover and a contract that said I had to tour for six months. <laughs> what has got him hammered? <laughs> and he signed this contract. He so he had to do six months on the road with Waters doing, uh, doing pros and cons of hitchhiking. And then Waters came back without him, and I went to see that one. And then I've seen Waters do The Wall uh, I, the, the, in the past few years. I saw him do Dark Side of the Moon one. And, and I've seen Gilmore and Pink Floyd, man, about seven or eight times. You know, just I, I, it's, I just, it's never a bad experience. My never a bad experience. I, I I absolutely love love Gilmore. My mm -hmm. fa my favorite so guitar I. lead of all time is off of um, the Division Bell, the lead in High Hopes. High Hopes. Yeah. Oh, is there is yeah. there a more beautiful? Uh, no. guitar? I mean, it's just so good. He's sitting there playing a slide guitar, and it's this. It's it's about a four minute solo, and you know you, it's yeah. one of those things. Wish there was more time. You wish it would go longer. I saw the Division Bell tour, so, so and, and, and he was amazing. Well, that was uh, that was, now, that, was, that, was the tour about... that was that. I'm sorry, that tour was called Pulse because they had Pulse, come out right. with right. They had come out with that. Remember, they came out with that double CD album, and the the interesting gimmick on it was it had a light that would just keep going, and it went on mm -hmm. for years. Yeah, I think just recently, like my my light went out on that that uh, album. Right, that's that, that, wow, Jeffrey. That's great. That's 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 good. I'll tell you another thing about Gilmore that it, one of the most underrated singers in the history of rock and roll. I mean, that guy's voice is stupendous, and I don't think he gets enough. He gets a lot of credit as a guitarist. I don't think he gets. I don't think he gets as enough credit as a guitarist. I don't either, but he gets a lot more as a guitarist than he does as a singer, and he's a. He's really an amazing singer. I think he's a good singer. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say amazing. Sean and I did did a, a, a show where we talked about uh, great guitarists, and Gilmore's name came up, but it wasn't as prevalent as like Jimmy Page and Eddie yeah, Van you Allen, know, you know. And, and I think, I, I think everything is good. Yeah, I mean, his his leads are are stupendous. One of my favorite songs in rock in rock history isn't really that great a song, but two of my favorite. Musicians are on it. Paul McCartney's No More Lonely Nights. It's Paul McCartney's song, and Gilmore plays lead. And that's like coolest thing in the world to me. Mm -hmm. That, you know, these two idols of mine join together. And I, I actually started an interviewing. I, I start, yeah, on that song, which <laughs> isn't a great song, but. but it's a cheesy but, song. But Gilmore's lead is phenomenal. Yeah, I mean. I, I gotta say, to me, it doesn't really like stand out when I, when I think about like Gilmore, just like guitar playing. I think about stuff just like how beautiful and clean like "Wish You Were Here" is. Yeah, you know, and, you know he doesn't he doesn't like his lead on "Wish You Were Here." Well, I do. <laughs> you know, you know what he said, but you know, it. his thinking on "Wish You Were Here" is that he's listening. It's a kid in his room listening to a song. So the whole down and down, 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 and the kid has a guitar, 
and starts just jamming that lead. And he said good, that. Thank you. He said that he <laughs> You're wanted the Winslow of, of our generation now. <laughs> <laughs> he said that he wanted to m muddle it up a little bit because he wanted it to be like a kid sitting in his room. Not, and now he looks back on it and he doesn't think it's clean enough and he, he really regrets doing that. He's like, because he's the only one who, who realized that he was doing that. Like, you know how, it, like, you even hear him, like, zip on the, on the string and but stuff. That's, because, but that's, what, that's the beauty of it. I know, but it bothers him. That's, that, I agree with you, Jeffrey, but it bothers him. Yeah, it's my, it's my favorite Pink Floyd song by far. Always has been. Wish you were and, here. Yeah, and then um, when Guns N' Roses play live, they do a little breakdown in the middle, like an instrumental breakdown, and Slash and Richard Fortas, the other guitar player, play Wish You Were Here uh, instrumental oh, in really? the middle of it. So Slash plays, uh, you know, Richard Fortas plays the lead, and Slash uh, plays the vocals on the guitar. Really? Every show, every show, yep. I think that may be my... I may like that better than uh, Dark Side of the Moon. It almost seems like it's an extension of Dark Side of the Moon. Well, right? my, my favorite, uh, it's not my favorite Pink Floyd album, but the one that just doesn't get enough, uh, to me, enough talk, people don't talk about enough is uh, Animals. Oh, uh, God, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of like a weird concept album because it, it you know there's only, again we talk about like only three pigs, dogs and sheep, and basically yeah. what, what you're talking about it's describing the different classes of society. It's such right. a deep album. There's nothing super catchy on it. There's nothing like "Have a Cigar" or "Welcome to the Machine." No, you're right. There's no single. There's no, there's, on no it. there's no single. No money. Right. There's no right. single. But his guitar work in Animals is incredible, man. What he does on Sheep is just ridiculous with the echoing of the guitars. And he's just, I just think he's in unbelievable form. Uh, I love that album. I love another album I don't love, but it has a great one. Uh, the Final Cut has a, a song called Not Now John, which just, I like that I song. Love that song. But also, that's, that album is a lot of uh, leftovers from the wall. Yeah, it is. is, is what, it, it is, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's also the last album to uh, feature uh, Roger Waters. Yes, it is. And yeah. interestingly and enough, the other original stuff on it, no Richard Wright on that album. No Richard Wright. They had kind of let him go at that point, and they actually brought him back as a paid session player, which was weird. When he came back with Mason and Gilmore started the next – version of Pink Floyd after the Waters. Momentary, momentary lapse of reason. Momentary lapse of reason, right, and and uh, Division Bell. And uh, at that time, they didn't – Richard Wright at first wasn't a part of it. They added him later. If you look at the Momentary Lapse album, I think on the back, I think it's just Gilmore and Mason. Even though Wright played on it, they only have a picture of the two of them. And Wright was paid mm. as a session player, which is so weird. I, it is so very weird. weird. I, thought he came, I thought he came back. Um – now, do you do you have any feelings on early Pink Floyd? I don't you know, like it. it. The Sid Barrett? No, yeah, I don't. I'm yeah. not. You know, uh, I I've listened to Adam Hart. Uh, the three of them. There was uh, Umagama, yeah. Adam Hart, Mother, and Metal. And but he wasn't on all. Sid wasn't on all three of those, was he? I don't think he no, was. He, he, he was no, he, he was. You know, he he starts. I mean, the first album is uh, Piper at the Gates of uh, Dawn. Right, and right, right. Like sometimes you listen to '60s on six on um, on, uh, on on, on uh, Sirius XM, they'll play it's like uh, music off of these albums. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, it doesn't sound like Pink Floyd at all. You know what? Gilmore is you know, not part Jeffrey, of the band. I don't like I it. I have friends. I have friends who love it, and I go, it I sounds like that Spinal Tap shit. Remember when Spinal Tap? Yes, under, yes. It, sounds, it just sounds and <laughs> yes, and it the, does. The other members of Pink Floyd talk about Sid like he was a genius, and I listen. I go, I don't get it. He was a 60s avant-garde guy who never would have made it any further to my in my thinking that to the 70s. He would have never lasted. He was, you know, he was Donovan and he wasn't even as good as Donovan to me. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah, what's his name? Uh, our, our producer Adam uh, checked in. He said Sid was only on uh Piper and some of Saucer Full of yes. Secrets. Yeah, yeah. so uh um, yeah, he's right. Yeah, so I mean, again, I'm not. I, wasn't, I never got the music, dude. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Um, 
Arnold Lane and all that. I just it, that you know it was a, that was their hit. That their was single. their big. That was their big breakthrough. Yeah. That's what kept them on the. Yeah, 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 yeah. But th- well, you listen to the you know uh, what was some of the songs like Bicycle or something like My Bike or something. It was just to me it was childlike. I, I didn't and people talk about it. I think there's always going to be that faction of people who go, oh yeah, it's Pink Floyd's really big, but I. Like them with you know, there's those people Rich, out there. Those who go, are the people that want to sit there and like, oh man, you just don't get it. You just mm-hmm. don't. Get, you know, it, 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 like it, like it, Sean it, says it, about his act. It, Sean says that about his act. Sean says just that about my it. act. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, Sean says no one gets it about your act. Sean says no one. I, I'm I'm the Sid Barrett of comedy. I do I do a lot of <laughs> avant garde stuff. Listen, I like, wish I wish you ended up like him. <laughs> I, I, don't um, want, I don't want people laughing, man. I want people staring at me for 45 minutes. Just, just, just kind of comprehend what I got. And then 10 years later, after I die, I go, oh, yeah, I kind of got that one. Yeah, remember you know that I, guy on the, remember that guy on the rooftop in fucking Sheep's Head Bay that we saw 12 yeah, years ago? In Bushwick. <laughs> you know, Bushwick. When, I, um, when I was doing Dr. Oz at NBC, I told her we were on, uh, you know, we were across the hall from Fallon. And uh, Fallon had everybody. I always thought that was the coolest part of Jimmy Fallon. He, you know, he had all these really cool older rock stars on all the time. I mean, I sat in in the in in Fallon studio and watched Robert Plant rehearse. You know how cool was that doing? was. Yeah, uh, I can't remember the song. It was, it was about. It was one of. The, I didn't really know the song. It was something newer. Uh, I I mean, I I showed Bon Jovi where his dressing room was. Things like that, right? So Fallon, for some reason, we weren't really good friends, but I don't know why he knew this, because we de- he, he knew I was into music, and he would really, he'd run into me in the hall and talk to me about different musicians that he had on the show, like McCartney, uh, Bruce, he'd had, and, and, but he, we never talked comedy. We always talked music. It was kind of cool. And when Roger Waters was on, I saw him the next day, and I'm like, dude, I can't believe you got to interview Roger Waters. I can't, you know, I go, I don't, I don't know if I could have. And he, he goes, how much of a dork did I come off like? He said, I just came off. And I go, no, nah, I really didn't think you did. And he's like, really? He, he was like, he really thought that he came off like an idiot fan, you know? And I didn't think that at all. I remember watching him do it going, I don't think I could talk. Was it a good interview? Yeah, it was good. I'm not, like, Waters is a, you know, as much as I love him, he's, He's a douche. Let's face it. I mean, the guy. Well, he's the reason man. why they broke up. Yeah, yeah. Hey, did you? Uh, he did. He did a movie a few years ago, of The Making of the Wall. I think it was The Wall. I can't remember. We went to see it. We had a limited screening. Me and my friends. And at the end of the movie, he sat with with Nick Mason, who had nothing to do with the movie. And they had a car cards, and there were questions. People wrote in questions to him and Nick Mason. And they ended the movie with the two of them answering questions. And one of the questions was, Roger, do you have any regrets from your time in Pink Floyd? And Roger Waters said, no, I have no regrets. And Nick Mason lost his mind, dude. He was like, none? You have no regrets. No regrets. And they, they were trying to move on to other questions. And Mason kept going, okay, well, let's take it. No, you have no regret. He kept going back to it. Like, you know, and I'm sure in his head he was like, he was such a dick. What are you talking about? How can you not regret what a dick you what it was? Yeah, he tried to also block them from touring and using the name. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He sued them. Yeah. He's, they're still fighting now. They're still fighting. Uh, Pink Floyd took down any Roger Waters stuff from their uh, website. And he's they, like, they, they did show you the hatchet at one point. They all remember they all got together. I think it was in yeah. 2015 when they uh, did the the uh the show in England, uh, which was cool because Richard Wright died not long after that. He died so in 2016. Good. Yeah, and yeah. you know, um, Sid died right before that, right? Like like a few like a week before that concert, Sid died. And, that, yeah. and that, you know when they when they made Wish You Were Here, I mean it's a pretty well known story, but Sid walked into the studio. Do you know that? Yeah, tell yeah, the story, though. For, uh, I saw a documentary it, on Making a Wish. It was just on yeah. last night, Sean. Yeah, all right. Oh, really? It was just on last night. Yeah, it's really the good. The Making a Wish here? Yeah, it's yeah. a great documentary. Yeah, on, on and, Access. Uh, yes, and I mean, but what are the odds of them making a, an album about this guy and they hadn't seen him in eight years 
and he just walked in. Like, how did he get in? Like, he just walked in. I'm the sure studio. somebody told him. Um, <laughs> This right. is what, well, way, way to ruin a good story, Jeffrey. But, yeah, this, no, it wasn't such this a is good my story. life, yeah, Richie. Yeah. This is my life. Because Gilmore yeah. said, was, Gilmore started crying, but Jeffrey yeah. just proved that. No, I'm no, no, no. He's, he's, he's a good guitar player. He's not a man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You, you, you knew this, Rich. Um, Combining your two favorite bands, the Beatles and uh, Pink Floyd, where did they record uh, Dark Side of the Moon? Yeah, Apple Studios. Abbey Road Studios. I'm sorry, Abbey Road yeah. Studios. Right, yeah. right. As a matter of fact, uh, they tell a great story about when McCartney was, they were making their first album and, and the Beatles were recording um, Sgt. Pepper down the hall. And McCartney came into their studio one day and was talking to them about how you guys are the future you know, and, and make the future bright. Like he, he was even talking then, like in his, in his mind, they were almost done. And he was talking to Pink Floyd about, you know, because they were the first band to ever have lasers and shit like that. You, you know, they, you know, they were like uh, way ahead of their time with things like that. And McCartney was telling me, he goes, you guys are the future. We're old men. Hmm. Which is kind of cool. It, you know Cameron cool. Diaz, the actress. You know her father was like a technician for Pink Pink Floyd for like twenty years. No, I had no idea about that. Yeah. I haven't even heard that. Yeah. Which, uh, which which albums did he uh, work on? I don't know. I I don't know that he did the albums. I think he was working on the tour, the touring when they were touring in the seventies. You remember who was the uh, the primary engineer on Dark Side? Uh, yeah, Dark Side of the Moon, right? Um, Glenn Johns. No, no. no. Primary engineer. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a, a, a hint. Before it, every I, Bulls game and every sporting event, the the Eye in the Sky, the prelude to Eye in the Sky is played. It's his band. Na band named after him. Oh um. Ah, oh, god damn it, Jeffrey. I had a big hit with a song Alan called Alan Parsons. Game. Jesus. Alan Parsons. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. I couldn't think. Alan Parsons. We just should have kept torturing yeah. him with clues that way. He you know what's funny? I just saw it. I just saw an interview with Alan Parsons about that album, but I just couldn't think of his name. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in my fifties. I don't remember anybody's name. I know the other thing of great about Pink Floyd was just how iconic their uh, album covers were. Oh yeah, yeah. I think they look good on T-shirts and posters. Like you remember, like Dark Side of the Moon has has the uh, the rainbow with with the moon and Wish You Were Here. The album cover with the two men in yeah. shoes shaking hands. One of them is on fire, right? Yeah. What was his Did name? The poster. Did you ever see the poster of the naked chicks that are sitting down? I love that poster. Oh, I whacked off to that poster so many times. Oh, my bed, those man. girls, those girls' asses are unbelievable. Oh, and it has all their album covers on their backs. Yeah, it's really cool. Love That's it. It's really. Adam also just chimed in with this. Uh, he, he wants to know, did you guys ever uh, sync up Dark Side of the Moon with The Wizard of Oz? Yes, I did. You've I done did. that? Yes. Is that a real thing? I've never done that. Never it is a real, real thing. It's like, it's like at the very beginning when the lion roars. When it's the like lion right roars, start the, the second, album. <laughs> yeah, the second time the lion roars, you start the album. You've done that, Sean? No, I'm not a loser. <laughs> but uh, I have heard the story. Yeah. I did it. I did it with some friends one night. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's kind of yeah, cool. Right. We'll take you. We'll take you word for it. You know, like when they're doing the lunatic is on the grass, the scarecrow's dancing. So it, it's kind of like at, at the same time as at uh, that. It and just has to be a coincidence. That is looking yeah. for shit right there. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Nick yeah. Nick Mason said. Uh, if you start Amagama and Oklahoma at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's two things that will never happen. I'm never going to listen to Amagama in its entirety, and there's no fucking way I'm watching Oklahoma again. Okay? <laughs> again, Sean, again. Yeah. But he's watched it. Yeah. Shirley Jones, baby. She, she was the bomb, Shirley, Shirley Jones. Jones. Yeah, mother in the Partridge family. Um, there was one other thing. Oh, yeah. We, you know, you're right. We did leave, live a lot of parallel lives because we used to do the same thing with the wall. We used to get stoned. We used to take quaaludes and just, uh, you know, we used to take quaaludes and listen to the wall. I mean, the wall, we used to hang out at my friend Evan, Evan Snapper's house because he would, you know, there was never anybody home and he was a really good cook and we'd get baked. And was just he on Staten Island, Jeff? 
That that is as Staten <laughs> Island as Staten Island can be. We would drive around in my friend Dean David's Grand Torino. Okay, drive around going to keg parties looking for chicks. Okay, it would, first it would start off with five of us. Then we go behind the the, uh, the building at Tottenville High School, pick up two more guys. Now there are seven of us looking for chicks. God forbid a girl ever came over, she would just use us for her beers, and then we go back to Snapper's house. I guarantee you, you and I were at a party together somewhere along the way in the '80s, Jeff. There's no way that we didn't like end up at a, somewhere where we didn't know we were in the same room or something. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? Where did you live? I lived on the North Shore. I lived right across the street from Stone Harbor. Oh, okay. but I went to, but I went to Farrell, which is out the other side. So oh, a my, lot of my son went to Farrell. A lot of my time was spent out that way, you know, out in Tottenville and Great Kills and all that. So you so, have, did you go to the rock clubs back in the day and see Zebra? And I Christmas worked Christmas? in one. My brother, my brother managed the Park Villa. Do you remember the Park Villa? Of course. The, the big thing about Park Villa, I don't know if it's a rumor or not, it's, but didn't Madonna play there? Ma Madonna played there, yes, before it was a rock club. She played, no. Was it Madonna? No, it was uh, Cindy Lauper. Okay. Cindy Lauper played there. Um, I, uh, my brother ran that. My brother was the manager of that club in the 80s. Oh, and wow. And my, my brother was a it. singer in a band back then called um, Armageddon. Like oh. I remember Armageddon. that. No, but... My brother played with Vito. My brother sang with Vito on, in, in one band, Vito Brada from White Tiger. Great guy, Vito Brada. Started Great off in, Still lives remember, in Staten Island. Remember, he played in Storm and when Farrell used to do the Battle of the Bands. That's right. That's right. He was a good guy, man. I like Vito. Um, he actually lives, from what I hear, he lives on the same street now as uh, David Johansson, which is so weird that the two biggest rock names from Staten Island move back to Staten Island and live on the same street. And you know what he, from what I understand about Vito is he's living a quiet life. He gives yeah. some private lessons, but really yeah. wants nothing about going back on tour. And he's had tons of offers to get back with White Tiger and other other uh, bands. Yes. Watching him in the band and he just keeps saying no. But I was, I was a bartender at Park Villa and then it became on stage. It was called on stage after that. And then I would go, to, remember Heaven? Do you remember Heaven down off of Bay Street? That was a rock club. Heaven, I don't remember. I remember the Rock Palace. and did Rock you Palace? Dude, I was at the Rock Palace all the time, man. My brother played there all the time. Yeah, we, we definitely had to be in the same Look club. at Sean. He's so upset over this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sean. It, it comes up on just about every show. Zebra Twisted Sister. Whenever I hear the word Twisted record. Sister, I, I actually hold my breath and hope for a fucking massive heart attack just to fucking end it all. I really you know, do. Yeah, here's something else that comes up on the show every now and then. You I work for I CBS a, Records. I know. I, you're no, in the Irishman. I know. I'm in the Irishman. Um, but... <laughs> You know, I had a record you store. You owned a record store. I know. I owned a record store in Staten Island. Remember Four Bridges? This fucking Christ. Remember Four Bridges? Yeah. I owned the record store in Four Bridges. That's how I put myself through school. I was like 21 years old at the time. And you I had Twisted Sister. And store? I had and I had Twisted Sister come in and do a signing. I had AJ and wow. um, and uh Eddie Ojeda. <laughs> Can I tell a story that um a few years ago, uh, and only the, this is so funny. You guys must go through this too. You have a friend, and they introduce you to another friend, and they always go, "This is Richie. He's a comedian." Like, and you're always like, "Why?" You don't go like, "This is Bill. He's an accountant." Why do you have to tell everybody? You know, do, don't you hate that when people oh, introduce you? Time. What's this, the deal yeah. with these people that introduce you as a comedian? <laughs> oh, I want to know. So, a buddy of mine. Great guy is a. Well, Sean is going to have a stroke before this is over. <laughs> I might. <laughs> a buddy of mine, the same. It's as everything a that he hates. It's Staten Island. It's it's twisted system. This it's is, reminiscing this is a back Island. in the '80s. <laughs> a buddy of mine's a singer. He's the lead in this Bee Gees cover band, and I mean, he looks just like Barry Gibb. He sings. He's amazing. He's amazing. What? The band called Tragedy. No, it's not tragic. It's New York Bee Gees. Oh, okay. I think that's him. So um, Pete, Pete Mazio, great guy, great guy. So Pete was performing one night out here, and I went to see him. And after the show, we went to a bar to have a drink, and he got a phone call. I'm with, we're with a few other people, and he goes, 
hey, do you guys want to go see Randy Jackson? And I go, well, which Randy Jackson? I go. I know where you're going. I love Randy Jackson. Yeah, I go, uh, is it the judge on American Idol? Is it the Jackson from the Jackson 5? Or is it the, the rock singer? And he goes, the rock singer. I go, well, where's he playing? He goes, there's some little bar out in Huntington. He's some little, little I, I go, what? He goes, yeah, he does this all the time. You want to go see him? I'm like, yeah. And we walk into some dive bar, and there's Randy Jackson by himself. And he does a lot, doesn't he do a lot of Zeppelin and Beatles? Doing Zeppelin, doing uh, Floyd, doing Beatles, just do, and dude, unbelievable, singing like a motherfucker, playing guitar, and then at the end of the show, he does "Tell Me What You Want," and he sounds just like the record. I mean, he, you know how high he would "Tell Me What You Want." I mean, he's doing, and he's like, I'm like. Oh my God! It was one of the best shows I've ever seen, and no, and like people are not even paying attention. I'm like, so after the show, he comes over because he knows my friend, and I'm like a little starstruck. I'm not gonna lie. And he sits down. He goes, "Hey, what's up, Pete?" And my friend goes, "Hey, what's up, Randy?" And, my, and he goes, "Oh, this is Richie, by the way." And I'm waiting for he's a comedian because yeah, I he know doesn't drop it. <laughs> he doesn't drop it. He yeah. doesn't drop it. And I'm like. So, like, I don't get the guy, because you know he's going to, oh, really, where do you work? Oh, oh, you know, all that shit. So now he walks away, and I go, dude, dude, why, why didn't you tell me I was a comedian? And he goes, well, I know how you hate that. I go, you pick <laughs> now? <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> you can always count on your friends. Right, yeah, that's I mean, when you need him the most. This that's is like the day you chose to stop introducing me as a comedian. Now, yeah, now, now he's gonna honor. Yeah, now, now he's now gonna downplay it. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not yeah, gonna yeah. time, Richie. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> hey guys, man, this was a great, great episode, wasn't yes, it? it? Was absolutely yeah, a lot of fun. I knew it would be when you said you and Sean. You know, I I thought well, yeah, I don't really like Sean, but he kept his mouth shut, so it was good. It was just me Very and you, true. Jeffrey, and. It's and we didn't even talk awesome. fantasy football, brother. We didn't even I, I get to talk good. fantasy football. Like Jim Florentine, Sean is a big um, uh, fantasy football fan. Uh, I've asked him to join our league. And what answer do you give me all the time, Sean? I won't play fantasy football because I like pussy. He thinks it's gay. <laughs> he thinks it's gay. What's what's gay about it? You know, we, come on, we we all get together, we we bust chops, we make jokes. Is that gay? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just glad I'm back in. I'm in that league, the comics league, and I I was in the league for, when it started. And Mike Keegan runs the league pretty much. I mean, you you help him, but he's the president, right? He's so the last president. year, he's the, last no, year, he's, the, he's the commissioner. He's the commissioner. So last year, he's trying Sean to find a date where we this. This this is nails on a chalkboard for him. By the way, I don't but say the, the word Mike Keegan. I say Long Island's Sean Morton. <laughs> 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 really do you steal my act Dude, look, <laughs> i actually posted a picture it was three years ago today or yesterday i booked uh keegan and john consoli on a show in jersey was and there a stage strong enough to hold that <laughs> <laughs> so uh I, I i booked them and i said mike listen i booked John to headline the show. I wanted you to come out here just to take a picture with me, just to prove that we're two different people. <laughs> two, two of my best friends, by the way. I I, I love John. Kinsley. I know a lot of people don't like him because he, he gets drunk. He's, 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 he's an amazing what? guy. He's an amazing guy. Fires Club. That's right. You know, and I performed the night you were inducted yes, at the Fires. Did. Yes, you did. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that was a fun night. And then I'm, that sucks for you that you got, you really, you got in and then everything, all shit hit the fan with that, bro. Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. I don't just even know like if they're going to come back. Just like I stopped, uh, you know, working a day job on Valentine's Day because my, my comedy uh, schedule was so uh, fucking <laughs> loaded through April and May. You know, eh, whatever. <laughs> Who needs fucking income, right? <laughs> yeah, Money is very overrated. But last year, they were trying to come up with a day where we could all get together for the draft. And Keegan writes me, and there's one day that I can't do. And he, everybody else can do that day. So I said to Ke Keegan, I wrote, 
if this is the only day that you can make work, just don't just take me out of the league. But I didn't mean it. I didn't think he'd really do that. And the next thing I knew, I'm out of the league. The and that was a good draft too. We, and we, Jeffrey uh, hated that I wasn't in a league with him, and you put me in that other league, which was nice of you. Yeah, that was fun. That was, you that guys was played Dungeons and Dragons after you fucking draft your fucking kickers in the third round. You don't, you don't, you don't draft a kicker in the third round, Sean. Fucking no. You wait for the end. I love both of you, but you're both fucking losers. <laughs> and like, Fuck like, you know, like sometimes Richie and I, like during football season, we'll, we'll talk, we'll text each other, yeah. and you know, we'll talk fancy football, Sean. Yeah, what we talk about that all the time. We do. <laughs> all in right, fact, this well, is a great is show. I'm in the we'll only thing. be talking about fancy football. No, this fucking. Yeah, I just lost Saquon for the year, bro. I don't have him. I lost Saquon for the oh, year. You have, well, don't you have Saquon and McCaffrey? I have McCaffrey in the in other league. league. I had the first pick in two leagues and took McCaffrey in one and Saquon in the other. Just to be no, safe. Right. I lost McCaffrey in your league. You're right. I lost McCaffrey and Le'Veon Bell. I I I'm, I don't have any. Can we? Do you have any running backs you want to trade? Uh, okay. yeah, just, I, I I do actually. Send me uh You know, I, right. I I just cut Jordan Howard. I can't take him. Yeah, I, can't, I don't play every year. I don't blame you. No. I don't blame you. I who mean, are you playing you this? Me? Before we wrap it up, who are you playing this week? Uh, I don't remember. Gordon Bakerbone. No, no, it's. I don't remember, bro. Can't remember. Who are you playing? Kenny Warren. Oh yeah, how's his team? Kenny Warren is is the reason the name of our team of our league is licked that shit. You, well, you at the, you were at the first draft, right? I was the one who I said we have to call this league lick that shit. At, at Black he Betty's. was amazing. He was amazing. With that those girls. was, was insane. Yeah. I'm playing the, the town I, pub I, in Bloomfield, New Jersey, which is sold out, but you can't get fucking tickets for it because it's sold out. I'm doing a real man's thing. I'm doing comedy. Are anyway, you gonna put some makeup on your face so people aren't scared. Outdoors at night. I'm good. People, people it looks like a lot worse than it is. It looks people a lot like, worse than know. it is. How is the comedy? I don't know, but the eclipse was amazing. <laughs> Why is the Kool Aid Man behind the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I think I killed Richie Bird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was great, man. You guys gonna fun. do my podcast? We are. Yes, we are. We are. Okay. Separate so, uh, things. I hate Jeff. So, Rich, let, let people know where they could find you. Uh, what do you have coming up? You know, some, some uh, shameless plugs. I'm going to do a few shows in New Jersey starting in October. You can find me at richieburn.com. Um, uh, and I have my own podcast that I think we're starting the first Tuesday in October, which I think is October 5th. Mark Rick and Don and I do a, do a podcast called Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. We're starting season three, probably October 5th. Look for it. Uh, we have some great guests. We uh, mostly, it's, it's a bunch of comics sitting around. We talk about what our favorite, we have a drink, whatever your favorite drink is. So you guys will love that. Then you have to tell a street joke and then we go into stories and you just tell stories by your years in comedy. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, we've been doing it for three years now and I really enjoy it. So look for it. Drinks, jokes, and storytelling with me and Mark Riccadonna. Do you guys know Riccadonna? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. I've worked with Rick Adana before. Um, yeah, but listen, man, we we appreciate you coming in. We were supposed to have uh, Scott Schwartz from uh, the movie Toy Story on this show. Well, not Toy Story. What was it? Uh, Christmas Story. <laughs> I mean, he, was, he was also in a movie called The Toy, which, and I wanted to find out about what it's like to work with uh, Richard Pryor Fire. and Jack Gleason. You know? Yeah, they, they yeah. Were both in that. But, uh, was he uh, the kid talent, in that? Was he uh, the kid in it. Yeah, he's a kid in it. Um, he's, yeah, but he's, uh, but our talent coordinator, son? no, our talent coordinator, Mike, um, first day on the job, first day on the job, as as yep. Robert De Niro said in um, Copland, you blew it. <laughs> so he blew it. That's my De Niro, by the way. Did you ever I work with De Niro? Yet? I, I did work with him uh, in the uh, Irishman, by the way. I, I don't know if you saw. It. I don't know if I mentioned it. But I did, and uh, I, I have stories. But uh, I, we, we have we have to go. Sean has to go. I got to go to the gym. Richie Byrne has to uh, uh, change his pants because yes. those things, those buttons, was screaming when we took that shot. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. I don't have any buttons on my. I have a zipper. Uh, it looks look like you're wearing like those Levi button pants, like you know. Yeah, mom jeans. No, on. Like, you had fucking mom jeans. Ones? On. You couldn't. You the couldn't tell the, the, zi the zipper looked like it was missing teeth. It looked. It looked like Leon <laughs> Spinks. <laughs> Okay, uh, on that note, Adam, anything to add? Sean, anything to add? No. No. Okay. Well, guys, this was this has been another rousing uh, version of uh, Who's Your Band? You can catch it on every Friday we, we come out. We're on everything. Please uh, share and, and tell your friends, and uh, we look forward to the next one. Take care, everybody.